Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, our final writer tonight, his name is Nick McCavichus, and he describes himself as a half-crazy wordslinger who lives and breathes all those weird little what-ifs that most people dismiss out of hand. He's the author of eight novels and counting, plus his all-new collection called Thong-Sized Stories. Not only does he hear little voices in his head, he argues with them. <laughs> his work is available digitally on Kindle and also the old-fashioned way. You can follow Nick at his website called theimaginaryplayground.com. He's also on Twitter, Goodreads, and on Facebook. Nick, please. Hi, everybody. I uh, just wanted to say as a volunteer here on these events, it's really great that all of you came out. It was kind of uh, a day I heard described a couple of times here just mingling with people as a day that you curl under a blanket with a good book, pop in a good movie, and uh, it speaks volumes about the kind of the literary scene out in the west suburbs. It's very alive and well, so thanks for coming. I'm going to be reading from the new book, Thong Size Stories. It's a collection of short shorts I did with my writer's group, it kind of as a challenge to myself. I'm awfully long-winded, as most people who have read my writing will tell you, or listen to me for a while. Anyway, yeah, if you like what you hear, you can get nine more for four bucks for a paperback, or two bucks if you got one of the nifty Kindle devices, or one of the my phone things. You can get it on there, too. They have an app for it. To preface this, uh, during my day job, I'm a mailman. I work with a lot of people who are often either hungover or wish they were hungover. <laughs> the day after a holiday like Thanksgiving is probably the worst day for an upbeat, optimistic person like me to work there because everybody is just not want to be there. We have a heavy workload. Everyone's naturally hungover or they had a fight with family, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, my job there, my unofficial job is to make everybody laugh with weird crap. So day after her Thanksgiving last year, I'm going in, I'm driving about 30 minutes. I start coming up with this strange, weird story about a turkey. And uh, that eventually evolved into this story that I'm reading today called The Turkey Incident. And uh, it's about animals, sort of. It's about families. And uh, it's nothing like what you just heard, so uh, I don't know if I'm really feeling good about following something so poignant. <laughs> In any case, you'll at least get a laugh to close us out tonight. Thanks again for coming. This is the turkey incident. When we walked in on Thanksgiving Day, carrying homemade pies and whipped cream, my eyes found the strangers first. It wasn't hard, since they were the only dark-skinned folks present at our normally all-Caucasian gathering. Now, I'm about as far from racist as you can get, so the second thing I did after saying hi to all my young cousins and nieces and nephews who adore me was go up to the newbies and introduce myself. A smile and a handshake work on just about everybody, and I soon learned they were Jamaican refugees displaced by a nasty hurricane. Turns out this family, man, woman, and teenage son, they'd lost everything but their lives. Possessions, heirlooms, all of it, gone in the wind. My well-meaning aunt had decided to adopt them for the holiday through some charitable program or another. I don't know which one. Sounds cool though, right? A fresh approach to, to, to tradition, which also play, pays homage to the original idea of the holiday. Very different cultures sharing table and time and camaraderie. By the time everybody settled into the spacious rec room with drinks and snacks, the Jamaicans were engaged in three separate conversations. Since the rec room was adjacent to the kitchen and without dividers, my aunt could even remain part of the conversation while she prepped side dishes, checked temperatures, and handed off silverware and china to her kids for the dining room table beyond the kitchen. It was a nice hour. Just enough time to unwind from the travel and get into the spirit of the holiday. The end of all that came while I was talking to my aunt on the couch. Bonk! It came from the kitchen. My aunt was up and back to the kitchen before more than half the room knew something was up. Wearing a frown for the first time that day, she peeked in her sundry pans and pots and found nothing amiss. By this time, several of us, myself included, had drifted kitchenward on the off chance we could help. Bonk! All heads turned to the oven. 
Together we watched the door rattle open an inch as another bonk came from within. It thumped back closed on its own, but in that second, that fleeting second of escaping heat, I spotted a dark shape moving in there. My skin crawled, and it made a weird noise, kind of like ew and yuck mashed into one. Like, ugh. Those of us already up rushed to the oven. Almost everybody else got up and looked at each other like people do when things go from normal to weird. Many eyes touched my back as I stepped in front of the oven, which began jittering in place. My aunt toggled the oven light, making the square of window on the front glow yellow. I was closest to her, so together we leaned over and peeked inside. Bonk! Something obscured the window from the inside. It was there and gone, but it left a greasy beige smudge running down the glass. Bonk! The oven scooted forward a fraction of an inch. My aunt grimaced through clenched teeth as she looked at me. Her pulse throbbed in her corded neck, and the fear in her eyes mirrored the flip-flop of my suddenly nervous stomach. Bonk! The door opened and slammed home again. A hand touched my shoulder, and I nearly jumped through the ceiling. My stoic father-in-law, ever the practical man, proffered an oven mitt and a meat fork as his eyes darted toward the oven. When he glanced at me again, his expression said, Nick, I'm retired. It's your turn to take point. Given the immediacy of circumstances, I couldn't exactly argue, so I donned the mitten on my left hand, took the two-tined steel fork on the right, and looked to my aunt. Open it, Nick. She, oh, excuse me, open it. She hesitated just a second. Maybe if she hadn't, what happened next could have been avoided. But how does one fault somebody for gathering themselves in the face of the bazaar? As she yanked on the handle, whatever was inside bonked the door again, driving it flat. I raised the fork and oven mitt on reflex. My father-in-law had a better view, so he uttered the first curse a second before the Thanksgiving turkey flew out at me. Featherless, dripping, and steaming, the headless bird shot between everyone at low altitude. My aunt screamed as the turkey bounced off cabinets opposite the oven with a meaty smack. Rather than fall, it spun and flew upward, sizzling wings flapping, stuffing leaking out its backside just like a live bird crapping as it makes for the sky. Down, I yelled. I'm still not sure if I was warning the guests or challenging the turkey. Either way, reflexes took over. I jabbed upward with the meat fork. It caught the turkey in the breast. Hot juice and even hotter stuffing splattered my arm as the bird twisted and drooped. The fork bent and caught on a bone as the turkey recovered, stubby wings flapping the whole time. Its frantic motion jerked me sideways toward the dining room. By this time, the little kids were screaming. The big kids were swearing right in front of their parents. And the adults did a little of both. <laughs> my father-in-law grabbed for me as I lurched into the dining room, but he only grazed my shirt. Time slowed as I neared the long rectangular dining room table, spread out with the good china and silver, the orange napkins tented, the salad and dressings and condiments all laid out ahead of time. In the space of heartbeats, I faced a choice with no good options. Let go and allow the turkey free reign of the house, or hang on and be dragged over the table. I tightened my grip, thinking, well, nobody else is doing anything. My arms sizzled and stung. My teeth ached as I gritted them together in a grimace. My, the hand on the meat fork throbbed on the verge of a cramp thanks to my death grip. I reeled closer to the table, naturally right between the two high back chairs, and in another of those moments of pure reaction, I flung the oven mitt at the turkey. As my now free left hand swung up to the neck of the meat fork, the mitt flipped end over end and slipped neatly over the turkey's flapping wing. In a moment, uh, another moment of just a second too late, momentum hurled, oops, yeah, momentum hurled me into the table, sorry about that, pushing my legs out from under me as I clung to the meat fork. The turkey crash landed at the center of the table with the force of, well, a 22-pound bird full of stuffing and grease. Plates crunched, glass broke, a spoon flipped into the air, glinting in the light of the chandelier, which short-circuited when the spoon cracked two bulbs and created a buzzing metal arc between exposed filaments. 
The salad bowl squirted out from beneath the turkey and crashed through the glass front of the china cabinet beyond the foot of the table. And more dishes crunched under me. Vaguely, I felt some slick, hot laceration on my leg, but I spared it no attention at all as I hauled the turkey through unlit candles and a cornucopia. It left a nasty brown streak behind it, lurid against the white tablecloth. Outrage lent me strength. I dra dragged the spasming turkey close as I gained my knees atop the table and spotted the carving knife in its proper place beside my uncle's usual mid-table seat. Jamming down on the meat fork with my left hand, I snagged the knife with my right. The turkey gave a mighty heave, which almost tossed me off the table. My head rolled, and I glimpsed the family crowding me in behind me, all of them gape-mouthed and wide-eyed. With a battle cry that was part yodel, part pure scream, I righted myself, raised the knife, and threw myself at the turkey. I hacked off the wing, not wearing an oven mitt in one smooth slice. Triumph-fueled vengeance, and I swung the knife again, and again, and again, and again. I pivoted the carcass using the meat fork, lopping off slabs of meat, whole drumsticks, part of a breast, even the last stub of neck. My knees sloshed in mashed stuffing and slick butter, and my burned arm throbbed, but I didn't stop. When there weren't any limbs left to dismember, I switched grips on the knife and stabbed downward like a serial killer in a slasher flick. I stabbed until the meat fork came free, and then, with a roar of triumph, I dropped both my weapons and dug into the remains with my bare hands, rending and tearing and squeezing and cracking bones until many hands grabbed me from behind. Voices called my name, but I ignored them as I snarled and buried my head in the meat, which was unquiet even now, twitching beneath me as it clung to a last stubborn shred of life. My mouth opened, my lips and tongue burned, but I pressed inward, chewing at anything I found, gross or not, deeper and deeper. Finally, those hands closed on my shirt and dragged me backwards. Despite the grease in my eyes, I took a final look at the bird which had defied logic and reason and the spirit of the holiday. What was left wasn't a turkey anymore, but it wasn't moving either. I was escorted back to the rec room and placed in a chair near the fireplace. The looks from the relatives who left me there were wary, like they'd seen something new and ultimately frightening in me. I said nothing, since after all it was true. The Jamaicans were seated together on the couch across from me. The boy sobbed into his mother's wide bosom. The father watched me with his lips pressed into a hard, flat line. You did right, man. His patois was accent was thick. I studied him for a long moment before nodding. He leaned forward, keeping his eyes on me. I didn't like the intensity of his stare, but my wounds and sudden fatigue kept me still and silent. My son, he is Bokor, he whispered. I told no one. I thought Samuel could control it. He looked at his still upset son. His mother whispered and stroked his hair, but he shook his head against her and sniffled some more. I don't get it, I said honestly. What the hell is a bokor? Voodoo practitioner, magic, resurrections, animation. When the hurricane came, he was just starting his studies. He sighed. This will scar him. I searched his eyes for When I couldn't find any, I said, oh, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> Anger tightened his face, there and gone. Replacing it was weary resignation of distant but dull eyes, something like waking from a nice dream. It made me wonder if being a bokor was an honored position or a lucrative skill. If so, this turkey incident was akin to a med school student feigning at his first sight of blood. Eventually, the Jamaican dragged himself out of it. He set his jaw again, nodded. Yaman. Yeah, he leaned back and put an arm around both wife and son. I turned my head and watched my family as they cleaned up and looked for salvage, hope, anything that might mitigate this insanity. Nobody in the rec room said another word, so there we sat, foremost of a house full of victims that Thanksgiving day. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Not exactly Norman Rockwell, but there's our holiday show. Just wait till you hear what we're doing for Christmas. 
Okay, reminder, Waterline Writers next event is Sunday, December 15th at 7 p.m. right here in the studios. Please like us on Facebook if you'd be so kind.